get this uh, presentation going. There we go. All right. So our final installment of the Road to the Civil War uh, presentation um, is uh, going to focus in on the Lincoln-Douglas debates, um, the rise of Abraham Lincoln, and the John Brown's raid, and ultimately the election of 1860. And so uh, in 1858, uh, Abraham Lincoln will decide to challenge sitting uh, senior senator from Illinois, uh, the author of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, um, the, uh, the little giant, Stephen A. Douglas, and then challenges Douglas to a series of debates around the state, okay, um, in, in what they officially become known as the Lincoln-Douglas debates. And, and I think what, uh, what what students need to understand about the Lincoln-Douglas debates is that going into the debates, Lincoln is a he is a major underdog, um, to say the least. Uh, in the state of Illinois, uh, Stephen Douglas is a king, and to defeat Douglas would be a tremendous uh, uh, upset, um, to say the least. But at the end of the day, uh, at the various debates uh, held around the state, the national media is there to report on what was considered to be uh, the most fascinating Senate race in 1858. Um, and now, wherever Lincoln and Douglas met um, through the series of debates, Lincoln used these opportunities to force Douglas to defend the, his law, the uh, Kansas-Nebraska Act, in, in order to get him to um, acknowledge, you know, um, the um, um, the weaknesses and the flaws within the uh, within the law um, in the Freeport Doctrine uh, during the Lincoln-Douglas debates. D Douglas said in his Freeport Doctrine that Congress could not force a territory to become a slave state against its will. And, and Abraham Lincoln ultimately makes, in, in this report doctrine, makes Douglas look like a complete bum in the fact that he was, he was uh, successful in getting uh, Douglas to be very critical of the Dred Scott decision. Um, in which it stated, you know, Dred Scott stated that slavery would not be, um, that Congress could not make a law that kept slavery out of the territories. And then here comes Douglas, who says that, uh, that Congress could not force a territory to become a slave state against its will. So finds himself having to um, go against the uh, Dred Scott ruling, which will ultimately weaken Douglas in his bid for president in 1860, uh, but Lincoln, you know, as he goes when he goes around the state, he's, you know, he is uh, accused by Douglas of being a friend of the black, uh, being an abolitionist, and um, and Lincoln really um, 
it, depending on where he was. If he was in the in the northern portion of the state, um, Lincoln was often seen campaigning with Frederick Douglass. Uh, no doubt, at the time, the most famous of all black abolitionists uh, in the United States, if not the world. And uh, and of course, when he's campaigning in the lower section, the southern section of Illinois, uh, the more rural uh, areas closer to uh, the Ohio River and, of course, the slave country. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was a bit cold on the issue of slavery and abolition. Uh, in the southern portion of the state, uh, Lincoln would not be seen with uh, Frederick Douglass. But, but ultimately, what we need to understand about the Lincoln-Douglass debates is that he, um, the national media is there reporting, uh, following Lincoln and Douglass um, through these debates. And people around the country begin to learn who Abraham Lincoln is. Abraham Lincoln, though he loses the election, wins over the bulk of the northern states. And so by 1860, uh, he, Lincoln is a, uh, a leading candidate to win the Republican nomination for president. Uh, the Lincoln-Douglas debates um, uh, vaults Lincoln into... Um, a superstar uh, in and a rising superstar in the Republican Party. So, and of course, as as uh, as much as Lincoln was being a household name in the North because of the Lincoln Douglas debates, Lincoln is also becoming a household name in the South, and and Southerners began to uh, be, be I, I, I'd say grow very worf, uh, fearful of a potential candidacy of Abraham Lincoln. Um, they really feared him. So, uh, since the early 1840s, the Garrisonian abolitionists had openly championed this union. Time made them quite unpopular. Um, they were they were a small, uh, but a very vocal minority in the North. But, however, in the South, um, especially as we begin to approach the late 1850s, uh, few denied a state's right to dissolve the bond of union in the same way that the original states had ratified it. And as the South became increasingly a, a conscious minority, beset by anti-slavery forces and aware of its growing isolation in the Western world, more and more Southerners were, be, were willing to consider secession as a possibility in terms of, again, protecting themselves. As I mentioned in class, the, the South by 1860 see themselves as a uh, minority um, and the the North um, as a, uh, a a tyranny as a as a country that has garnered and and gained a, and accumulated a tremendous amount of political and economic power and really feared what what Abraham Lincoln and the Republicans might do with, um, that power. Uh, it's also important, I, I want you to understand, in 1858, in the same year um, of the Lincoln-Douglas debates, is the same year that Lincoln delivers his divided speech. The House divided speech, of course, is one of your outside readings. I want, I want you to take a, a, a special opportunity and make sure you read it for... Uh, Okay, so, so the, the one that's, of course, to the, uh, you know, prior to the election and the uh, secession of South Carolina happened in October 16th, 1859, and 19 others, um, white and black, uh, crossed the Potomac River uh, into Virginia, uh, which is, really, it's West Virginia, but really exist then, um, crossed the Potomac and uh, under the cover of darkness in order to attempt to seize control of the federal arsenal uh, in Harper's Ferry, Virginia. And his, uh, of course, the, the driving force behind this raid uh, would be to uh, seize weapons in which he would be able to arm slaves. Um, and uh, he was hoping to then, uh, with these freed slaves, um, the uh, create a black stronghold in the mountains of West Virginia and provide a nucleus of support for future slave insurrections across the South. 
So if Brown had failed in his purpose, whatever it was, he had basically achieved two things in what is called John Brown's raid. Uh, one, he had become a martyr uh, for the anti-slavery cause, and two, he set off a panic throughout the slaveholding South. Um, but go back to John Brown. There is a, a video that is required watching on YouTube. It's called John Brown's War, in which uh, the, the 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 program will will take the uh, A push student through um, the the life of John Brown. You know, culminating in John Brown's raid. You know, after killing pro-slavery men in Kansas in 1856. Um, John Brown, of course, left the territory in 1859. He appeared in Virginia, and, and that's when he, he carried out his raid at Harpers Ferry, Virginia. Um, there in Harpers Ferry, weapons and ammunition were stored at uh, an arsenal. Um, again, Brown's plan was to give uh, the weapons to enslaved African Americans to start a slave rebellion that he thought would spread like fire through the South. Uh, now, one thing that John Brown did not uh, anticipate, he did not anticipate uh, that the good people of Harper's Ferry might actually try to stop him. And uh, he ended up finding himself in a, in a firefight uh, at the arsenal, uh, trapped within the walls of the arsenal. And the next morning, uh, U.S. Marines led by uh, Robert E. Lee uh, arrived from Washington the next morning, uh, surrounded Harpers Ferry, surrounded the arsenal, and 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 engaged and, and eventually captured uh, John Brown. Um, he wounded John Brown, and and of course, uh, ten of Brown's followers were wounded, killed. Uh, Brown himself was captured. Uh, he and six others were tried for treason, and uh, and eventually was hanged. But uh, at his sentencing, um, John Brown delivered one of the classic American speeches. He said, quote, Now, if it is deemed necessary that I should forfeit my life for the furtherance of the ends of justice and mingle my blood further with the blood of my children and with the blood of millions in this slave country whose rights are disregarded by wicked, cruel, and unjust enactments, I say, let it be done. On the day of his death was a day of solemn observance in the North. Prominent Republicans repudiated Brown's group, but the discovery of Brown correspondence revealed that he enjoyed the support of prominent anti-slavery leaders who, whether or not they knew it at the time, what they were getting into later defended his deeds. Uh, there is um, uh, a vast uh, uh, database of eulogy speeches that were delivered, sermons that were delivered in northern churches by, by preachers and ministers and the like, um, extolling John Brown as a man who died for a cause. So John Brown becomes a martyr. He becomes a hero in the North rather than a rather than being viewed as a, a villain or a murderer or someone who had committed treason against the United States. He was going to be regarded in the North as a saint. In fact, it was it was uh, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson who said, the new saint will make the gallows glow as glorious as the cross. Okay, make the gallows as glorious as the cross. So uh, so they see, you see is painted in Northern churches, John Brown is, as a saint, as someone who died, uh, who, who sacrificed himself for the, the, the betterment of the slaves, and he becomes a martyr. Uh, Garrison, uh, the lifelong pacifist, now wished success to every slave insurrection in the South and in every slave country. Uh, but by far the greatest after effect of Brown's raid, there's a, in, a, in a mood to distinguish between John Brown and the Republicans. In the Southern mind, now merged those who, would co who contained slavery with those who would drown it in blood. Republicans to be a party of John Brown lovers. And uh, as the Atlantic Confederacy said, quote, we regard every man in our midst an enemy to the institutions of the South. Who does not boldly declare that he believes African slavery to be a social, moral, and political blessing? So they begin to associate John Brown with the Republican Party. So the party of Abraham Lincoln 
is going to be tainted in some way by John Brown and the fact that many Republicans, uh, rather than condemn John Brown's actions, actually will um, um, uh, acknowledge him as a, a heroic figure. Um, as Theocides said in his commenting, of course, he's a prominent Greek historian, and uh, commenting on the Peloponnesian War, he said that the Greeks not only did not understand each other any longer, the Greeks did not understand each other any longer, though they spoke the same language. And really explaining why there was that civil war between Athens and Sparta. Um, is that that yes, they were both Greek, but they had grown so incompatible that even though they spoke the same language, they no longer had anything in common. They had no reason to be together. And so ultimately, that's where we're rapidly going to. And so um, also another big point I want you to know about the uh, uh, John Brown's raid is that John Brown's raid actually... Um, leads to the forming of the Confederate Army in the South. In response, the, the belief is, is that John, that there are other John Browns in the North who are trying to foment slave revolts throughout the South. And so Southern, Southern states begin to build up militias and armed forces uh, to defend themselves from the radical Republicans who are attempt, like John Brown, who are attempting to foment slave revolts uh, throughout the South. Now, the disintegration of the Democratic Party in the first session of Congress, which convened three days after the death of John Brown, confirmed the sectional divide and reinforced the South's growing discontent with the North. There was a, a major dispute for the election of Speaker. And it will ultimately carry over into the Democratic nominating convention held in Charleston, South Carolina. So that in order to nominate their candidate for president of the United States, the Democrats held their convention and probably one of the worst cities, uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Charleston was a hotbed of secession talk. It's the hub of secession of the of the fire eaters. And um, so by 1859, the Dems were the only national party left in the United States. And at the nominating convention, the Gulf states, uh, the lower Southern states, had sent extreme Southern uh, states rights men uh, of course, like I said, Charleston Convention was a hotbed of extreme sentiment. Fabulous. Came into the uh, uh, came into the convention wanting to endorse the 1856 platform of the party, which simply promised congressional non-interference with slavery. So his position on slavery was very moderate. And that really upset, if you look at number four, it really upset the Southern firebrands who are now demanding the federal protection of slavery in the territories. And so at the, the Democratic Convention in 1859, uh, there is a sharp division between the Northern Democrats who support Douglas and the, and the Southern Democrats who want uh, who are really, you know, calling for protection of slavery and uh, uh, a federal law to protect slavery in the territory. The convention continues. Says the platform debate reached a climax when Alabama fire eater William Yancey informed the another the Northern Democrats. Again, the failure to defend slavery is a positive good. Senator offered a blunt reply. Said, "You mistake us. We will not." So the issue essentially disintegrate the Democrats in their parties. And uh, when the Southern planks lost in the platform committee. The convention, followed by Georgia, uh, Arkansas, and Delaware. So, uh, with those delegates out of the convention, um, the the convention will nominate Stephen Douglas as its candidate.
candidate. And it, it made the Southern Democrats so angry that they met two weeks later in Baltimore uh, where they nominate um, John Breckinridge of Kentucky as their candidate for president. So in 1860, um, we have a divided Democrat party um, between Northern Democrats who support Douglas and Southern Democrats who support John Breckinridge. So another cord of union had snapped the last remaining national party, and that paves the way for this man, Abraham Lincoln, to, to, uh, to win the election of 1860. And so uh, Abraham Lincoln stood for the prevention of slavery into the territories. He opposed the Kansas-Nebraska Act and the, and the doctrine of popular sovereignty. Okay. Um, October of 1854, in his Prioria speech, Lincoln declared his opposition to slavery, which he repeated en route to the presidency, speaking in his Kentucky accent with a very powerful voice, he said the Kansas-Nebraska Act had a, quote, declared indifference, but, as I must think, a covert real zeal for the spread of slavery. I cannot but hate it. I hate it because of the monstrous injustice of slavery itself. I hate it because it deprives our Republican example of its just influence in the world. And so, it's in effect, Lincoln says the reason why he hates slavery because it makes the United States, which is built on all men are created equal, this idea that all men are created equal, is built on Republican virtues of equality and liberty. It makes us look like a bunch of jackrabbits to the outside world. You know, the outside world sees the United States as a, a, a hypocrite, um, that, you know, we... we we see ourselves as this republic, this built on um, virtues of liberty and inequality and republicanism. And the existence of slavery makes us look very, very hypocritical. Um, and American historian Eric Foner, who is actually the author of your textbook, uh, contrasts the abolitionists and the anti-slavery radical Republicans of the Northeast who saw slavery as a sin with the conservative Republicans who thought it was bad because it hurt white people and blocked progress. Foner argues that Lincoln was a moderate right in the middle, opposing slavery, primary because it violated the Republicanism principles of the founding fathers, especially the equality of all men and democratic self-government as expressed in the Declaration of Independence. So, so as, as Lincoln's running for president, he according to Eric Foner, uh, Lincoln is a moderate on the issue of slavery. He's not so much that abolitionist that sees slavery as an immoral sin. Um, he's not an evangelical, let's put it that way. Um, and he's not one of the conservative Republicans who thinks it's bad because um, slavery blocks progress. It holds the United States back economically. Um, he's right there in the middle. Okay. Now, the Whigs had been irreparably split by the uh, Kansas-Nebraska Act. Lincoln wrote, I think I am a Whig, but others say there are no Whigs, and that I am an abolitionist, even though I do no more than oppose the extension of slavery. And drawing on remnants of the old Whig Party and on the disenchanted free soil, liberty, and Democratic Party members, he was instrumental in forging the shape of the new Republican Party. Okay, so he was labeled by his opponents as many things. You know, they, they called Lincoln a guy. You so know, one thing that, that, and I think it's important to note this, I didn't mention this with the, the Lincoln Douglas debates, but the, what Douglas beat Lincoln over the head with, and Lincoln had. Very difficult time um, responding to this charge. Douglas charged that Lincoln supported the equality of the races, 
that if, if Lincoln would, was elected, he would he would create a country in which um, uh, Negro equality, and and so. And Lincoln had a difficult time as a politician to try to diffuse that. And, and you can see even here in the quote in red, he says that uh, he really didn't know what he was. And he said, I think I am a Whig, but others say there are no Whigs. Um, and people say I'm abolitionist. And even though I, I'm not really one, he says, if anything, I'm slavery into the territory. So at the 1856 Republican National Convention, Contest to become the party's candidate for vice president. After the state Republican Party convention nominated him for the Senate in 1858, Lincoln delivered his house divided speech, drawing on the Bible uh, passage Mark uh, 3 25. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe that this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall. To cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. The speech, of course, created uh, an evocative image of the danger of this union caused by the slave debate and rallied Republicans across the North. The stage was then set for the campaign for statewide election of Illinois, in which really Douglas, Douglas would ask Lincoln, hey, what did you mean by that house divided speech? So Lincoln also had to defend that speech, which oftentimes was very difficult for him to do. Um, so the Cooper Union speech, you're not going to need to know that. I just think it's important that Lincoln uh, gives the speech in New York City in which he absolutely wows the crowd. Some of the leading Republicans uh, are there, and he delivers a speech of a lifetime in which he wins over people and ultimately helps him win the nomination in 1860. Uh, as, as Douglas and other candidates went through their campaigns, Lincoln was the only candidate in 1860 who gave no speeches. Instead, he monitored the campaign closely and relied on the enthusiasm of the Republican Party. He produced the majorities across the North. They produced an abundance of campaign posters, leaflets, um, newspaper editorials. There were thousands of Republican speakers who focused on the Republican Party platform and second on Lincoln's life story, emphasizing his childhood poverty and uh, educating himself, um, you know, rising from the very bottom. And, and Lincoln, they portrayed him as a frontiersman. They called him the rail splitter. You know, a rail splitter is someone who builds his own fences. Uh, but they call him the rail splitter. And uh, the goal was to demonstrate the superior power of free labor, whereby uh, the, and not slave labor, I mean, we talked about free labor before, whereby a, a, common, a common farm boy could work his way to the top by his own efforts. The Republican Party's production of campaign literature dwarfed the combined opposition. A New York Tribune writer produced a pamphlet that detailed Lincoln's life, and it sold anywhere from 100 to 200,000 copies. Uh, it definitely became evident that the Lower South were intent to leave the Union if Lincoln were to win the election. And so during the election, Lincoln attempted to tone down his rhetoric in order to prevent this from happening. And ultimately, Lincoln wins the election with 40% of the electoral vote or excuse me, 40% of the popular vote. And he ultimately wins because of the split of the Democratic Party. And quite honestly, had the Democratic Party not been split, he would have won anyway. And so there's the electoral uh, map in 1860. And you can definitely see a sectional result uh, where the only way Lincoln could have won the election is he had to win the North. He had to win every one of these Northern states um, he does really good amongst uh, the German immigrants, German Americans especially. Um, but outside that, um, you can see the South is, is very much um, with, with the Southern Democrat, John Breckinridge. Um, Douglas only wins. Douglas loses his home state of Illinois, 
uh, only wins um, uh, Missouri and a, a portion of uh, New Jersey. Um, you can see he pulled wetter, um, Douglas pulled better um, in the in the popular vote, right? Uh, but not, but did not fare very well in the electoral vote. And the Constitutional Union Party, um, which was John Bell of, of Tennessee, um, John Bell, uh, he was a compromise candidate who was really the party's goal was to try to deprive um, Lincoln from winning. Um, Midwestern states, and but ultimately, I think the important thing is that it was a it was a compromise party, um, a, a which was largely focused on a platform of uh, preventing disunion, preventing disunion, and you can see that um, it's a significant portion, a pretty good portion of both the popular and the electoral votes. Uh, December 20th, 1860, South Carolina votes, um, passes the Ordinance of Secession. Um, by February 1st, 1861, uh, the entire Lower South was gone. That's Alabama, Texas, Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, and Louisiana. The rest of the South refused to join the Confederate States of America. And so the Confederacy elected former Mississippi Senator Jefferson Davis as its first president. Alexander Stevens of Georgia was elected vice president, and Buchanan and Lincoln immediately opposed the Confederacy by declaring the unconstitutionality of the Act of Secession. And it's important to note that when Southern Secession took place, Buchanan did nothing to stop them. There's your vote for Secession. Now, there was a last ditch effort um, to prevent civil war. It was introduced by John Crittenden. You need to know this. This is the Crittenden Compromise. Uh, Senator from Kentucky, um, trying to fill that role left by Henry Clay. Uh, the bill offered a constitutional amendment recognizing slavery in the territory south of the 3630 line, uh, non interference by Congress with existing slavery, and compensation to owners of fugitive slaves. Now, uh, Lincoln at the time was in Illinois, and he telegraphed to party leaders back in Washington to defeat the compromise. Okay. Uh, Lincoln, however, did tacitly support the proposed Corwin Amendment to the Constitution, which passed Congress before Lincoln came into office and was awaiting ratification by the states, but it too failed. It, the Corwin Amendment um, would have protected slavery in states where it already existed, it would have guaranteed that Congress would not interfere with slavery without Southern consent. Um, a few weeks before the war, Lincoln sent a letter to every governor informing them Congress had passed a joint resolution to amend the Constitution. So essentially, Lincoln was open to the possibility of a constitutional convention to make amendments to the Constitution in order to prevent civil war. Okay, So uh, the first inaugural address, um, Apprehension seemed to exist amongst the people of the southern states uh, in the ascension of the first Republican administration. Um, their property and their peace and their personal security are to be endangered by the Republicans. There had never been any reasonable cause for such apprehension. Indeed, the most ample evidence to the contrary has all the while existed and had been open to their inspection. It is found in nearly every published speeches of him who now addresses you. I do, but quote from one of these speeches when I declare that, okay, so this is actually uh, a quote directly from um, Lincoln's first inaugural. See, Lincoln goes into his first inaugural, and you gotta understand the lower South has already seceded from the Union. He wants to prevent other, other Southern states from joining with this, the lower South, um, and he wants to be non-threatening. He basically says, look at here in red, he says, I have no purpose, directly or indirectly, to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. I believe I have no lawful right to do so, and I have no inclination to do so. So he went out of his way, and he did this during the election as well, that he, he went out of the way to tell the South, 
not going to tinker with slavery. I'm not an abolitionist. I am not going to uh, destroy slavery where it exists. Now, we don't see eye to eye when it comes to slavery in the territories, but I, do, I am not a threat to you. I am not a threat to you. And so, but, but ultimately, um, this um, a showdown um, will uh, transpire um, over uh, the, uh, the issue of um, Fort Sumter. And so we will pick up with Fort Sumter when we actually get to the Civil War unit, the actual war itself. But, uh, but a showdown between Lincoln and South Carolina over um, withdrawal from Fort Sumter, an island fortress right there in Charleston Harbor. And so, so old Abe Lincoln. You also want to find on your um, on my YouTube channel. Uh, I will present. I will put together a video uh, talking about the importance of Abraham Lincoln, and and we'll we'll go over that as well. So, um, love that political cartoon. Hmm. All right, guys. Well, thank you. Have a great day.